Would you all join me in giving a hand to Chris and Susan for leading us this morning? For the very first time ever, uh, the last couple of weeks we brought in worship leaders from other cities, which has been great while Brad's been out. But this week, uh, man, it was awesome just to see uh, them step up and lead as if they do it every single week. So Chris and Susan, thanks for the time you put in. And by the way, Brad Kill is in the house with us. Our worship pastor's back. Brad and his family landed from China this past Thursday, and so they brought their little six-year-old, brand-new adopted son home with them. They brought their other two kids home with them as well, so that's good. <laughs> Thanks for not doing the trade thing, man. That, that'd be like, ah, oh, we'll give you one, give us one. So they're now a family of five, still jet-lagged, getting uh, into things for the very first time ever. So Zalay is their son. He's home with their other two kids, Carter and Belle, and um, they're experiencing this whole new life that they knew would come one day. And so, Brad, we rejoice with you. Get some sleep if you can. And, uh, and, and hopefully, he, he told me that he was awake till four o'clock this morning and that his daughter woke up at midnight and hasn't been to sleep since, or unless she's sleeping right now. I don't see her. Uh, so uh, be praying for Brad, Mary, Carter, Bell, and Zalay as they just uh, get used to a whole new world in so many, so many ways. Language learning and getting acclimated to life in America, San Francisco, all of those things. So I'm um, glad that you're here this morning. Have you ever, and I think we all have, but have you ever had that moment where something sounded like it would be amazing to do, and then you do it, and then you get into it, or you even finish it, and you look back, and you're like, that was a bad idea. Anyone? Like, we can at least think of dating relationships, right? Like, it seemed like it would be so amazing. That was a bad idea, right? Um, but we, we have these kind of experiences all the time. I have a, a close friend who just a couple of months ago, um, well, let me just give this caveat, being very, very, very pregnant, decided that a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts would be awesome. I don't see what... Th- the story should end there. Yes. Amen. I agree. I'm with you in this. Um, and she didn't mean this for, this was not a dozen hot glazed donuts uh, for her small group. Um, this was not a dozen donuts for her family of four or her husband. It wasn't a dozen donuts, some of which could have been given to her donut loving friend and pastor. Mm-mm. They were for her. And she, in her mind, she was like, this is going to be amazing. She gets in her car. She goes. Daily City is where the Krispy Kreme donut is. Anybody been? It's the best combination ever. You've got In-N-Out in one parking lot, Krispy Kreme right there. So if you're ever having a bad day, you've saved your carbs and calories for the year, um, go over there. Just go for it. So she does this. She goes. But you can imagine how this thing ends. She has the first two while the adrenaline's running and everything is going forward. And then, as I understand it, they, she throws away the other nine or ten left in the box. That's sinful, I think. Um, <laughs> I don't know how many messages I have to include that I love donuts before you save me the donut. But nonetheless, and this is a good friend. This isn't like sort of, you know, this is a very good friend. Um, But she did not keep the donuts for me. She thought in her mind on the front end, this will be amazing. And then when she got into the midst of that, or should I say when that got into the midst of her, um, she was like, "Mm mm-mm, I can say that. It's a church. It's okay. Uh, And then she's like, no, this is a terrible idea. Like, how is this going to relate? Well, whenever you and I begin to pursue what God's purpose is for us, there will be moments for every single one of us along the way. They seem amazing. What we've been talking about so far is like, hey, go for it, right? Don't be afraid. Trust God. Step out and go for it. And so you finally start going for it. And when I say to God, hey, God, I'm going to go for it, I think that God's going to make the path really smooth. God, I'm doing what you told me to do. Of course, it will be one of ease and comfort. But what happens is we come to these moments or even seasons where we're like, God, I think this was a bad idea. Why did I do this? Why did you ask me to do this? And so I want you to see it from our next episode of One Life this morning. When we look at Moses, he's going to be leading these two million or so Israelites, and they're going to have this thought, like, Moses, this was a terrible idea. So when we left Moses last time, God was saying, hey, I'm sending you. I'll send Aaron with you. I'll give you this staff. Go to Pharaoh. And so he ends up going to Pharaoh, and that's where I'm going to catch you up on, then we'll get into the text this morning. So he goes to Pharaoh. He uses his speech, and Pharaoh doesn't let them 
them go. And so God introduces Pharaoh and the Egyptians to these things called plagues, and the plagues start happening. Now, there end up being 10 plagues. If, if I'm there, maybe you're more uh, macho than I am. If I'm there, I'm out after the first plague, okay? First plague, the water in the Nile River turns to blood. I'm out. Um, our team that was in Uganda last summer, we got a chance to uh, do a safari out on the Nile River. And uh, I'm thinking, if that's blood, I'm, I'm done. So the Nile turns to blood. And the second one, for sure, like, it's over for me. Frogs everywhere. Like, in your home. There's everywhere. Like, all right, I'm done there. And then uh, come the gnats, and then a swarm of flies. And then all of the livestock of the Egyptians, the livestock all is killed. It all dies. It's all gone. Um, after the livestock, maybe the worst, the plague of the boils start to break out. That's, in, like, that's the worst, right? I mean, um, after, the, after the boils, then comes the hell. After the hell comes a swarm of locusts. Which one do you have tapped out after? I mean... <laughs> all of the above. Um, the ninth one is there is complete and utter darkness where the Egyptians live for three full days. So not just like at nighttime, it got really dark and the moon wasn't out. Like they couldn't really see each other at any point in time of those 72 hours. So those are the first nine plagues. But what God's doing in that situation is he's sort of upping the ante each time. And he's, he's, he's letting Pharaoh know, he's letting Moses know, and I hope he's letting us know this morning that God is willing to do whatever it takes to accomplish what he wants to do. Okay. He's willing, and, and it's one thing to find a person in life who's willing but lacks the resources to do what they want to do, right? And for some of us, that's been us our whole life, right? I've got a lot of dreams, but I've got no resources. Um, when you find God who has a desire to do all that he wants to do and the necessary resources and wisdom that goes with that, um, you want to fall on the right side of that problem, okay? So the ninth the nine plagues sets the stage for the tenth one. The tenth one introduces us to what maybe is the most popular word in, in Jewish history, the word Passover. With the tenth plague, what happens is the angel of death comes throughout the land and every home in Egypt that did not have blood sprinkled over the doorpost, the doorframe, um, every home that did not have that, the firstborn son in that home was killed. And finally, this is what it takes for God to break the will of Pharaoh. Yeah, I agree, right? And again, you would have had me out after one. But finally, this is the thing that breaks the will of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh finally says to Moses, okay, go, get out of here, be gone, essentially. Because Pharaoh loses his own son, his leaders, they lose their kids, his friends, they lose their son. And so this is a devastating thing. And finally, he's like, all right, go for it. And so Moses and these two million or so Israelites, they begin to leave Egypt. In case you're wondering, this is why the book of the Bible is called Exodus, because there's this mass exodus out of Egypt, and this is awesome, and they start leaving, but as soon as they start leaving, Pharaoh decides maybe letting them go was a bad idea. And so he begins with his powerful army alongside of 600 chariots. They begin, I've got great artist circle seats right here. Anybody that needs a spot, I've got four right here, and I'm not spitting much today. So um, come on in. Uh, it's fun to fill this thing up. I'm telling you, 1030, 1030, 1030, we're going we're gonna to get there. Uh, and, and so Pharaoh decides that he and his, pow his powerful army and um, 600 ch accompanying chariots are going to take off after the Israelites. And the Israelites, who you thought would have been so pumped to be freed from 430 years of slavery, right, under the rule and reign of Pharaoh, you think they would be like, this is awesome. And that was their initial reaction. But moments later, they're like, this was a bad idea. I want you to see it in the text this morning, Exodus 14. If you need a Bible, raise a hand and we'll get one into your hand that's raised. And we'll be on page 36 of the Bibles we're handing out. Keep those hands up. We will deliver. 30 minutes or less, or it's free. It's free already, but... Exodus 14, we'll read the section of scripture that's verses 10 through 14. And I just want you to be thinking, if you begin to pursue God's purpose and you end up in this moment or this month or this season or even this year, hopefully not this decade, where it's like, okay, God, I thought this would be awesome, but maybe me doing your thing, maybe this is a really, really bad idea. So stand with me. Let's look at the text. This series is teaching me so much. I believe God's doing a great work in our church, and I hope that it is going to encourage us this morning. So they're pursuing them, and here's what it says, starting in verse 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What what have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, 
Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Have a seat. This is such an exciting text to me. I've learned so much, and I'm hopeful that we'll walk out of here maybe in different, with different learnings, but that will be specific to what God is up to in our lives and what we need to know before we even move in further to the, what God's purpose is for us. The first thing we need to buy into is this. The path to pursuing God's purpose for our lives will not always be one of ease and comfort. The path to pursuing God's purpose in our lives will not always be a path full of ease and comfort. So um, collectively, let's take our surprise faces off, okay? And because what we tend to think is, God, if I do you a favor by going after your purpose, then surely it will be pretty smooth, right? But let me just m- remove all of your surprise faces. If you go after the thing God's got for you in this life, at some point along the way, the path will not be a smooth one. It will not be a pain-free one. It will not be one of ease and comfort. And here's the, the, the bigger problem for me is this one. It usually won't be resolved quickly, I'm pretty good at doing anything for like 10 days. Anybody else? We won't even talk about New Year's resolutions on March the 2nd. But for 10 days, maybe even a month, I'm good with it. But what happens is when we begin to pursue God's purpose, the thing doesn't resolve itself too quickly in most cases. When we begin to pursue God's purpose for our lives, the path, it's not one of ease and comfort. There will be these moments where this is difficult and it doesn't happen quickly. The Israelites have been enslaved for 430 years. A long time. So they, their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents, on and on and on, they had all been slaves under Pharaoh's rule and reign in Egypt. And, and, and that had been their story. But then they come and Moses is going to lead them out. How do you think they felt on that day? This is awesome. The thing we thought would never happen is happening. The thing that we prayed for for years and decades and centuries, it's now happening. And they begin this amazing exodus out of Egypt. But not long after that, they look back and they're like, oh, maybe this was a bad idea. And they begin to say to Moses in verses 11 and 12, Moses, what were you thinking? Moses, why did you bring us out of there? We told you it would be better to stay. Now, that sounds ridiculous to us, right? Because remember, whenever you and I are outside of a situation, what people are doing inside looks ridiculous, right? So we, we ask ourselves, why do certain people stay in relationships when it's clear to all of us, like, warning, 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 right? Why, why do people stay in certain jobs? It's because they're inside and they can't see the damage that's being done to them. And these are, are even addictions. So why, it's easy for us on the outside to go, why would they not want to be freed from that? Well, they don't love the results of it. But familiarity is one of the hardest things in the world for us to get rid of. We would rather lean into what's familiar than lean into what's good. We would rather lean into what's familiar than to lean into what's liberating or freeing. We'd rather lean into what's familiar than lean into God's plans for us. And so they're free. They have been enslaved for 400 years. Now they have a chance to get out. But all of a sudden, they're like, oh, gosh, Pharaoh and 600 chariots and the powerful army. And if anybody knows what Pharaoh can do, it's them, right? So it, it, it reasons that they would understand what's at stake here. And one of the things you and I need to know is this. Fulfilling God's purpose for our lives will include moments and seasons where it seems so unlikely that it will ever happen. Just know this. Remove the surprise face. Remove the surprise face. When we pursue God's plans for our lives... There will include, it will include moments and seasons where you just get to this point and the only thing you can say is, I don't know, or it doesn't look like this thing will ever happen. And we begin to think, maybe that was a bad idea. Have you ever had that thought? And you're like, God, have you tricked me? Because the last three weeks of this series, I've been saying to you through the scriptures and through this Moses' life, I've been saying to you, hey, go for it. God will be with you. Go for it. You can trust him. Something's missing last week. If you, you know, I know you don't remember, but um, something's missing. God will fill it. So let's go for it. And then when we begin to go for it, we come to this moment in the experience or on the path where here's what we say. Maybe this was a bad idea. Let me give you some examples. You, lady, and your husband, you believe that it's time to start a family. It's time to start having children. Okay, you believe it. He doesn't believe it. You've paid him off. So now he believes it. I'm kidding. You're both on this together. God's purpose. Your timing's perfect. You never argue. And you're like, okay, God, we believe it's time to start having kids. 
And so you start the nursery decorating thing. You find out if it's a boy or a girl. Or like my friends Dan and Betsy, you find out it's a boy and it's a girl. Uh, and, and, you know, everything just seems amazing. But there comes a moment, usually between the hours of 2 a.m. and 4 a.m., when you're like, and not in your church voice either, like, this was a terrible idea, right? You're just like, this is bad. What, like, why did you let me do this? Um, you know, and, and, and if you've never um, had kids, you don't know the 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. voice when you have a brand newborn, okay? Um, it's like, you know, you just ask Jesus for passes before the night starts. Like, you're just like, Jesus, I'm going to mess up, and I need your grace. But you, you begin to think, maybe this is a bad idea. Or, or you decide to start a business, and then one day you realize there's no guaranteed paycheck, and you begin to think again, maybe this was a bad idea. Or, or maybe finally you say yes to Lindsay. She's been asking you to lead a small group, and you finally say yes, and you prepare hard, and you have these amazing questions, and you spend 40 more hours than you should preparing for it. All right, don't spend 40 hours. I'll start feeling guilty about my own thing. Um, you, you begin to prepare for it, and you go into week one, and you ask these incredible questions, and here's the response you get. <laughs> and you're like, Lindsay, this is a bad idea. And she's, gonna, she's like, no, stick with it. Um, but in a more serious way, some of you are caught in an addiction, maybe right now. And you're starting to sense, like, hey, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of what it's doing to me, my relationships, my work, my well-being, my health. I'm tired of this. And so you begin to go, okay, God, I'll go to counseling. God, I will, I will let other men know if I'm a man. I'll let other women know my situation if I'm a woman. I'll, I'll get some help from the church staff. God, I want, I want to get out of this. And this seems amazing to get out of it. But you start getting out of it. And then one day withdrawal sets in. And all of a sudden, you begin to think, what? Maybe this was a bad idea. Because what's familiar is comforting. Let me give you something that I hope you carry with you your entire lives. I hope we can remind each other of that, of this. And here it is. Don't let short-term pain cause you to forfeit God's long-term purpose for your life. I feel like, Ben, what, like, I'm, I, ben I'm only going to take three notes today. This is one of them, okay? Don't let your short-term pain, because it's coming. Get the surprise face removed. It's coming your way. Don't let short-term pain cause you to bow out, cause you to forfeit God's long-term purpose for your lives. It's going to come. And it won't be as short-term sometimes as we want it to be. But don't let that short-term pain cause you to forfeit, to push aside, to lay down what God's long-term purpose is for your life. And if you're doing that right now, let me just ask you, like, don't, don't go there. Let me ask you this question. Is there... Is there something going on with your God-given purpose situation right now that you've laid aside because you found yourself in a difficult season? Is there anything going on in your world right now where you've set aside God's purpose for your life? Sometimes God wants us to delay, okay? Sometimes we don't have the discernment yet of what God wants. But sometimes we do, and we lay it aside what he wants for us because we just don't want to endure that painful situation. What do we do in these moments? What do we do in these moments? Here's what you do. Sometimes there is absolutely nothing we can do except watch God work. Sometimes, and this is difficult for an action-oriented, achievement-centered uh, congregation, which we are, and 95% of the time, this is a thumbs up that we are this way, okay? I'm with you. Let's go after it. Let's figure it out. Let's do it. Let's problem solve. But sometimes... There is absolutely nothing we can do except watch God work. No amount of activity will allow you to push the thing forward. Have you ever been there? So we, we either like hit our heads up against a wall or we just give up in hopelessness. Sometimes there's nothing you can do except watch God work. Look at what Moses says to the people in verse 13. And don't, rem don't forget what's happening here. They're being chased by the most powerful person and the army and 600 chariots. It sounds like terrible strategy to me. Here's what he says. Fear not. Oh, Moses, that's easy. These people have enslaved us. We know what they're capable of. They've killed our friends. He's like, ah, oh, fear not. And then this is the worst advice ever when you're being chased. Stand firm. I don't even do that in hide and seek. Stand firm. We're being pursued by this massive army. <laughs> Stand firm. 
and see the salvation of the Lord. And here's the key part, which he will work for you. Which he will work for you. When you begin to pursue God's purpose for your lives, there's going to be some work you need to do. This is not a lazy endeavor. God's going to say, I want you to do this and you need to work hard at it and you need to bring your best. But friends, some days, some days, God's the only one going to work. Work hard. Bring your best. But some days, take your seat and watch him work. Because on those days, and in sometimes those seasons, there's no work for you to do. But what we typically respond by is one of two things. Please make sure I'm not the only guilty one on this. We either respond by more activity, right? Or we respond by giving up. And God's saying, hey, no work for you, but someone's still working. Don't just keep going at it. And maybe you're in a moment right now where you're just trying to press on and press on and it's becoming pointless and fruitless. You just need to stop and think, you know what, God, this is a day where you've got to work. I've got nothing to bring to this particular current circumstance. So I need you to show up and I need you to do your thing because I can't bring the goods today. You're going to encounter that. And I want to say on the front end, let him work rather than getting to the back end and be like, oh, look at what God did. While you were trying to do it or I was trying to do it myself. Watch God work. He wants to work on our behalf, but we need to let him work, and we need to acknowledge that some days God's the only one who can do anything at all. November 2012, it was a Monday, and Mondays are an off day for me, so my schedule is Tuesday through Sunday. Monday's an off day. I like to walk the city on Mondays, six, eight, ten, one day, 14 miles. That was just, you know, you guys had worn me out the day before, and um, I'm kidding. Uh, but I just like to walk the city. And so I was doing this November 2012, and I received a phone call from our adoption agency representative. And she said, hey, Ben, just want you to know things aren't moving at all in India. And that wasn't surprising, really, because we had been told that that will happen in, in the process. Um, but then I knew it was a little more serious than I originally thought when she said this. She said, if you guys want to go ahead and request your refund, you can do that on this phone call. Or if you want to move to a different country, you can make that request as well. All of a sudden, I knew it was a little serious, and I'm thinking, okay, maybe this was a bad idea. And just to be honest, I go home, and I tell my wife, Shauna, uh, and I've got this persuasive speech, right? I mean, you think you've heard good sermons here. Just you should be in the house. <laughs> I'm like, Shauna, listen, I got this call, you know. I'm like, I think we should just get out. That's just me being honest. And, and it wasn't like I was, con like, hey, like signing on the line, but I was just trying to lead her to think, like, I was basically, you know, you know how you don't want to be responsible for a decision? So you're like, hey, we have this chance to get out. What do you think? Because <laughs> you want someone else to own it, right? Like, because now it's like, you remember that time I came home and, um, and she's like, no, Ben, I, I think God's going to do this. And we found ourselves at multiple moments like this in this process and in other processes. And it's just like, there's nothing we can do. We, can, we are not allowed to initiate any communication. There is no standard timeline. And many of you know, as of recently, there's now no guarantee she ever comes home. And I've tried to work, to be honest. I've Googled every imaginative phrase you can imagine to find out how this thing works. I mean, if you just looked at my Google search, you'd be like, wow, he is so desperate. And I continue to come to the same realization that some of you need to come to. I'm in a moment. Well, unfortunately, I'm in a season where I can't work towards this. I'm doing what I can. We just got Rosetta Stone, Hindi, trying to work through that. I'm doing what I can. I'm reading the books. But if God doesn't do his thing, this is not my job. This is not my job. Stand firm. Fear not. See the salvation of the Lord. And then in verse 14, Moses says, uh, this is like my favorite verse in the whole book of Exodus, okay? You remember how we talk about our part and God's part? He lays it out so clearly in verse 14 of chapter 14. Here's what he says. The Lord will fight for you. That's God's part. Are you ready for your active part? Everybody ready? Can you see it yet? Do you know what your part is in this, in this sentence? Don't say it in, in, in a bad way because I've got my, my kids are in the room, but um, God's part is to fight. And what's our part? But, but wait, God, let me help you. But wait, God, I've got some ideas. But wait, God, they are coming after us. Stand firm. 
fear not. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you. The Lord will fight for you, and here's your job. And I know we're all awesome at being quiet, right? He just says, watch me. Watch me do my thing. Charles Swindoll, in his book called Moses that I read through to get ready for this series, he says this about this particular thing. He says, if the Lord is to get the glory, he must do the fighting. If the Lord is to get the glory, he must do the fighting. Now, hear your pastor on this. This is not us making demands of God, okay? It's just saying, if God is in this to get worship, which he is, and he's in it to get credit, and his fame is at stake, and his renown, and his being valued, if that is what's at stake with him giving us a purpose, then guess who's got to show up for work? It's not me demanding. But let's just make it easy math. If you do all the work, guess who gets all the credit? And you should. This is not like, you're like, really? Pastor said, don't be modest, get all, no. I'm just saying if you do all the work, but I'm also telling you in the same breath, you, you can't do all the work. And I love what Swindoll says right there. He says, if God really wants to get the recognition, then guess who's got to show up with his gloves on? He does. He does. And he wants to, and he's, he's glad to. I want you to see how this um, kind of story finishes in, in verses 21 through 25. This is, if you, you, if you know anything about the whole Moses story, this is probably the one part you know, okay? You saw it on a cartoon. There's this Red Sea, and it did one thing to the right, one thing to the left. Here it is. Let me, let me give it to you in the actual text here. In verse 21 through 25, it says, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. I love God's plan. Like, I don't even know what driving a chariot heavily looks like, but I think I've seen some of you attempt out there on the road. Like, we're going to make them drive heavily, and that's going to mess this whole, you know, mess this whole thing up. There's something throughout this process the Egyptians learn about God and the Israelites learn about God. And here's what's wild. They both learn the exact same thing. Let me give you three examples from the plagues. When the livestock of the Egyptians died, guess whose livestock lived? When the Egyptians had three days of total, utter darkness, like can't see your, friend or your hand in front of your face darkness, guess who had light on those same three days? When the Egyptians' firstborn sons died, guess whose firstborn sons lived? They're learning something that you and I need to know, and you really need to listen to this. We either assume God's purpose for our life, or we don't. So the purpose we've assumed for our life is either in line with God's purpose, or it isn't. Now, we go through waiting phases, we go through discernment phases. I'm not saying that. But when we begin to pursue something full on as if it's really true and exists, we're either in God's purpose or we're outside of God's purpose. And friends, what I want to say to you this morning is which one you fall on really, really matters. It really matters. Look at what the Egyptians say in verse 25. Just at the end of verse 25, here's what the Egyptians say. They come to recognize something that the Israelites know and Moses finds out and we need to find out. The, the Egyptians say to one another, let us flee from before Israel because Israel is so strong. No, they knew Israel couldn't stand to them, right? They had a little bit of experience beating down the Israelites for 430 years. I think they know where they stand with Israel. They said, let us flee from before Israel for the Lord fights for them. Here's what they're saying. Remember, they've been around who they assume was the most powerful being on the whole planet, but they've just, through this process, have been introduced to someone more powerful. And though they know their strength, and they know they have the best army, and they know they have the best vehicles, and they know they have the best strategy, and they know they have the best resources, but when they see God step into the equation, what do they do? They acknowledge and admit to one another that this is pointless. When you pursue 
the purpose that God has for you, and therefore it's God's purposes, when you pursue that, there's things that come to you like this, favor, protection, provision, help. When you pursue a purpose outside of God's purpose, all bets are off, especially if you find yourself directly opposing God's purposes. So let me ask you this. Is the purpose you've assumed for your life in line with God's purpose for you? If it isn't, walk away right now. No matter how amazing you think it is or will be, no matter how amazing the world tells you it is, walk away from it now. But if it is in line with God's purposes, lean into it. If it is in line with God's purposes, know the short-term pain will come, but don't forsake the short-term pain and cause it, you to walk away from God's long-term purpose. Lean in and stay with it, even in the difficult seasons. And know throughout the process, it is okay on some days, some weeks, and some moments and seasons just to let God work and you just watch, sit down, and keep your mouth shut. And if you don't know what it is to be in these moments, let me just encourage you, they're coming. They are coming. They have come for our church. They have come for my family. They've come for you. They've come for our jobs. There are moments where you're like, God, I've, I've done all the applications. God, I've talked to this person. I've uh, branched out into my relational network. God, you've got to do your thing now. We have a friend in our church as of this morning, obviously he's in a health situation. We pray the doctors are going to do their things, but if he's going to be delivered, as I've just been told this morning, God has to show up. It's just a reality. And guys, when we pursue his purpose, this is how it works. We just have to sit back and go, God, you've got to work. But if you aren't familiar with how this whole Jesus thing works anyway, this is exactly how it works. When you and I could do nothing about our situation, but sit still, look to a cross, and watch Jesus work on a day that we couldn't. This is where all of that we talk about, everything we've ever said from day one, this is where it all is. Looking at the cross and with tears down our eyes as we worship, as we have gratitude, as we look at him, the only thing you can do is receive the work that Jesus did. There's no work you can bring to the table. You cannot change your eternal destiny by being a good person. You cannot enter into God's kingdom by thinking you have what it takes. The hardest thing for us usually to do is stop and watch someone else work. That's the only way we get in. But it's also the most secure way we get in. If you're on the outside of that this morning, let me just urge you as a friend, as a pastor, don't miss out. Don't think that because you can't work for it means you have to forfeit good things in your life. Because you can't work for it, if you'll embrace your limits like we talked about last week, what you'll find is a God who comes and fights for you. Stand firm. Fear not. See the Lord work on your behalf. Would you pray with me? God, I want to thank you for your faithfulness to us. God, I want to thank you for what you've shown us in the story of Moses and these two million Israelites. God, I want to thank you for how you've shown us that your power overcomes the great powers of the world, the great powers of our unlikely and impossibly seeming circumstances, God. And I just pray right now, God, that as a church and as individuals in this church, God, that you would help us to lean into your purposes, God, and we wouldn't allow fear or our circumstance or how unlikely things seem to cause us to bow out. God, when our church hits these points along the path, God, when we individually and as our families and our jobs, God, with health issues in our church, God, we, we reach these moments and all we can do is say, Jesus, we need you to work. Oh, Jesus, we need you to work. We need you to work uh, just as you did on the cross. We're grateful for that, but we need you to work in our situation. We've tried everything we can to get the job. We've tried all of the treatment. We've tried all of the trial drugs. God, we need you to work. God, we've tried to rescue our marriages, but we need you to work. God, we've tried to, to, to advance the cause that you've given this church, God, but we've done all we can, and now we need you to work. God, may we not be frightened by these moments, but may we embrace them, because when you alone can work, God, what I know is, uh, hopefully I can't screw this one up, God. God, I pray that you and your power God, you would free people in this room from the addictions. God, they want out, but the familiar is so powerful. So God, I pray that you would put men and women around them, that you would get them into the right situations um, and counseling, whatever it may be, God, whatever it is that you want to overcome in our lives. God, we look to you and we ask you to do one thing, God, would you work? 
Oh God, would you work? And would we rest? And would we embrace you? And would we watch you fight for us in the moments and in the seasons, God, when we can do nothing to advance the cause further? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and declare this. Thank <laughs> you.